glad to be here. Thanks so much. Um, let me first introduce uh, the panel. This is a really, really interesting and very knowledgeable group. Um, our theme is about this idea of a circular economy, and I will come back in a second and, and give a kind of two-minute version of, I guess, what that could mean or what it means, and then we're going to really unpack that for the rest of our time. Um, down there, we have, um, not in the order I have written, you guys didn't sit in the right order, but I'm pretty sure out of the three that you're David. Um, <laughs> David Eichberg, who is the Global Initiatives Lead um, for Sustainability and Social Innovation at HP, the very, very large, although half the size of what it used to be, um, tech firm. He's been in this field for 15 years, working on climate change, working on metrics, reporting, I mean, everything for the really big company. Then we have Jessica Long, who is a, a very senior person at Accenture, which you've probably heard of. Um, she is the, it's a long title, you lead the sustainability and trust practice in North America, and you're the global responsible business lead. That sounds like a lot of work. Um, and you used to work in the Senate. I love that part. We should find out about that if we're going to talk, talk politics at some point. And then my friend Bridget Croak, who um, is... Uh, working for a really interesting group called Closed Loop Partners that we're going to explore what they do. They're real leaders in bringing finance um, and knowledge to this idea of um, building more infrastructure around recycling and capturing materials in the world, but has a very long history in kind of end-of-life products. All right, so um, the question, I guess, on the table is can we end waste? How do we, you know, close the loop? Okay, so uh, you know, some of you, I'm sure, have thought about this for many years, but just a, a kind of quick background, um, this idea that the way our economy works, which is fundamentally linear, we take stuff, we grow it, we cut it down, or we dig it up, we turn it into products, then we use it, and then we throw it out. That's been the linear economic model for pretty much all of humanity. Um, it's become clear uh, over many decades that this can't continue, that this is not kind of functional as a long-term strategy. Um, and, and this ties to the kind of two really, I think, the big megatrends, the biophysical megatrends of climate, a changing climate, and declining resources or constrained resources. And I just want to give you kind of one data point on, on that this, this discussion of making a more circular model, which means basically everything we use in our economy and in our lives would end up back in some useful, productive place at the end. Um, that this isn't just based on a fad or just a nice thing in, in business strategy, uh, that there's a real kind of fundamental need here. So I was in um, Chile uh, a couple months ago for uh, the World Copper Conference. I was speaking at this event for the mining industry for copper. And because of that event, I kind of got to know the industry a little bit better and learned some really interesting and kind of scary things. That in just the last 10 years, the, the ore grade, meaning the percentage of every ton of rock that has actual copper in it, the thing they're looking for, that percentage has dropped 25% in the last 10 years and has really gone down about 90% in the last 100, 120 years, meaning you have to dig up a lot more earth. So what they've done, that industry, is the, the grade, the richness has gone down 25%. They've dug up 30% more stuff so they get the same amount, but it's taken them 45% more energy. So let me just say that again. They can dig up more, but it takes even more energy. It's going up not linearly, but almost you know, half exponentially. So there's just a physical limit that we're talking about now to stuff. And there's actually very few materials in the world where there is anything close to kind of a circular loop. I'd say aluminum is probably the best metal in the world or the best substance out of um, cars, out of refrigerators, out of whatever, out of cans. We capture a lot of the aluminum, but most stuff just ends up somewhere, um, other, away, as they say. And the, and the old line in the circular world is that there is no away. Um, so this is, I think, one of the fundamental kind of sustainability like ahas. When you get into this field, when I started getting into this, yes, two decades ago, um, and reading about it and going back to school for this, you have this aha of, wow, things really have to be circular like nature which is really the, the, the most complete cycle, nothing goes to waste, um, or we can't really continue. We can't really function as a, as a society in the long run. So um, we are in a really interesting place where this topic has gone from introduced 40 or so years ago by a scientist named William Stahel, brought back into the public eye another 20 years after that in this book, Cradle to Cradle, that said we have to have kind of two cycles of materials, one that are technical, man-made, and one that are kind of organic have two different circles because they kind of don't mix well. And then brought more recently in the last decade by the Alan MacArthur Foundation out of the UK, kind of brought this idea of circular back. Um, but no one, you know, 
the, the term has been around for a long time and arguably has been in use for five billion years, but you know, has been around in business for 40 years. So there's tons of conversation about this. Um, I think what we're gonna explore is how far we really are and, and have we really made much progress. Um, I think by the way I just asked that, you can probably guess where I think the answer lies, but I think we're moving quicker now than, than we have before. So um, I think we wanna start actually with um, a little video to give a demonstration of what a kind of a particular project looks like on the ground. What does it look like if we're saying we want to be circular? What does that mean for getting materials and turning them back into products? So if, I don't know if we can play. Do I hit next? Plus passer ça pour nous capables de nettoyer le pays avec Pogina en avant la CIA. Moi, je joins tous les petits amis qui viennent nous aimer. Nous sommes là dans nos pays l'école, là dans nos pays caille, là dans nos pays qui nous l'école, là dans nos pays tout le monde. Nous allons changer dans la vie. Moi, je suis entré dans sa bouteille qui fait nous devenir payer, nous payer quatre pays. Ok, après ça, je suis venu dans le plastique là, et puis je suis venu continuer, je suis venu à l'école et je suis continuer à faire. Ça fait moi, mais je suis venu à l'école, je suis venu à l'école. Je suis capable de vous dire ce que ça fait, je suis intéressé. Congratulations to HP. Uh, yeah. uh, I know, David, um, you know, maybe we can kind of unpack this a little. And you have, it's not just the cartridges. You have other products. You have some computers that are, that are heavily um, recycled content. Maybe you can just talk to us a little bit. I mean, if you watch this story, you go, well, that just looks like recycling, right? Like, what's, what's different? Um, tell us a little bit about kind of how HP's thinking about circular economy and how it's evolved maybe from just we should recycle stuff. Absolutely, Andrew. Thank you, and, and thank you to um, the to the organizers of the Silicon Valley Institute and to the supporters and the sponsors of the or Sun Valley. Sun, Sun Valley, sorry, Sun Valley um, <laughs> Institute, and uh, and the, for the opportunity to to share and to learn from this um, f from from this uh, from this forum. Um, I think I'll unpack that a little bit by by speaking a bit about the strategy and the innovation behind it that we see here, and then the initiative itself. Mm -hmm. So as I'm sure we'll talk a bit about, we, like many companies, see the circular economy in a series of loops, all starting from in the customer and returning to the customer. And so at the outermost loop, this is about products and materials and recycling, really the story that we do see here. And then a loop within that is around product reuse and refurbishment. And yet within that loop, there is one about utilizing products more as a service. We, we see that a lot in the sharing economy today already. And finally, within that, or there are probably even more loops, but one around product repair um, and serviceability, upgradeability, with the goal in all this really being to keep materials and products in their highest state of value and use for as long as possible. So as we've 
work more in the space, we've really found that it is very complementary to where our business strategy is now. Um, we're, HP as a company is focused on core growth and future markets. Uh, people are familiar with HP printers and, and computers, and at a core, really serving the consumer and the commercial market is where we need to continue to deliver the best performance, value, um, design, etc. But really what we're seeing more and more is that people want more with less. People want smaller products. They can be more powerful products, but they have to be energy efficient. People are looking for solutions at the end of that use. So we need to be building in both more material and energy efficient products, as well as those reverse cycles so we can bring back and reuse and recycle materials. Um, in our a key part of growth markets is, as mentioned, people want to be able to just use a product mm -hmm. as a service. So we'll probably talk more about some of these other areas as well. But being able to now change our business model and, and, and approach product as a service is key. And lastly, uh, in the future, we're really looking at breakthrough innovations around digitization. 3D printing, for example, is something um, that has some real transformative capabilities, we believe, around product longevity and repair. But in terms of this innovation, you know, it goes back to around the time that I started at HP, where um, for many years, well, I, I don't date myself this far back, but <laughs> about 25 to 30 years ago, HP began a, a consumer recycling, a customer recycling program. So you can now return um, hardware as well as our printing supplies. And for a long time, you know, they were typically, they're going into a standard recycling um, process for cartridges, for example, metals are separated from plastic. Metals have a pretty clear recycling commodity stream. Plastics were difficult. They didn't have a lot of great uses. They would tend to get downcycled into fence posts or park benches and the like. But we said to ourselves after some years, you know, we know what this product is. We, we've had to qualify this plastic. So why can't we figure out a way to reutilize this shred into casting brand new cartridges? But to do that, we found that we needed to strengthen that fiber back up again. And we needed a high volume, readily available, consistent supply. And we found that in two places, plastic water bottles, PET, and we found it in uh, plastic apparel hangers, polypropylene. And through a series of innovations, where cycles got shorter from five years to three years to 12 months in different generations of these plastics, we're now using this at a really significant volume. So you buy a cartridge today, an HP cartridge, an inkjet cartridge, 80% of our cartridges have between 45 and 70% recycled content. A laser jet cartridge, 100% of them have about 5 to 35, if I'm remembering right. So this kind of material has a significantly lower carbon footprint. It, use, it utilizes less energy to make than digging up more material mm -hmm. and copper out of the ground in order to make that. And we're using it on a scale now of 3.8 billion cartridges have been oh, made Jesus. to date. Wow. That's about 780 million cartridges that haven't gone to landfill through our recycling program, 85 odd million clothes hangers, 4 billion plastic water bottles. That's a rate of 1 million plastic water bottles a day. So this is a global scale. Now, I've just told you this story of innovation. It probably took me about four minutes. Yeah. And after years and years, we tell it very much a great engineering story, perfect for people at HP. But really, in a way, this, is what, this was a solution in search of a story. And it was, at a, it was at an event very much like the Sun Valley Forum, where a colleague of mine was relating the story on stage. I, think I was, thinking, I was at a, uh, a Clinton Global Initiative. And they were approached after the uh, event by Thread International, a nonprofit working in Haiti, working along with other partners, including Timberland, to source this plastic, turn it into a, um, into a plastic uh, fiber thread for clothing, for apparel. And we found this is a whole new way. It, plus, on top of it, we can now begin to address the challenges that you saw in Haiti of ocean-bound plastic, the need for more environmental, uh, the need for more economic development and jobs, and getting children who are working in the landfill to collect these bottles out and back into school. And so in a sense, what this story also really represented, I think, is a way to scale down the problems. To go from much bigger to say, this is how we made it accessible and human. And this is how we feel that a circular economy needs to be more than just about the planet, mm -hmm. but it should also be about the people and the communities. Yeah, that that makes from. sense. And that makes the business case uh, a lot easier to make internally, yeah, right? Sense. And just to tie what you said before about the reducing the amount of uh, virgin plastic, again, the, the, the connection to the climate, 
is that those plastics are petrochemical based and there's a huge footprint to their life cycle. So really raising the recycled content in our, in our plastic stream is, is a very good climate solution. Um, Bridget, you have a kind of long history in, in the recycling world. Maybe you can give a kind of brief overview of what Closed Loop Partners is and what they're doing and how you guys view the circular economy versus traditional recycling. So just off topic or on topic yeah. <laughs> to what you just said, um, I think plastics is the fastest growing use of petrochemicals today. So if you actually look at the decline of use from an energy perspective of petrochemicals and go, you know, renewable energy picking up, there's still a significant increase in um, mm -hmm. raw and petrochemicals going into plastics because that's the fastest growing packaging stream. So that's, it's a, to Andrew's point, being able to integrate that in and pull less raw materials out of the ground is a really important shift in terms of de decreasing the use of petrochemicals. So, um, so yeah, so closed loop partners, just a bit of background. Um, the way that we came about is looking at the economics. And what's great about this whole story of the circular economy is in theory, it should make a really great economic story, which makes all this stuff much easier to sell uh, and makes it work a lot better. So cities, in the, I think, in the US spend about $5 billion a year throwing about $10 billion of material that's of value in the garbage. So that's a net negative of $15 billion just throwing away money. Um, so that doesn't make sense, obviously. But, um, but we have all this embedded infrastructure, to Andrew's point, in the linear system. We have billions and billions of dollars of invested capital going into large scale infrastructure from collection mechanisms of material to sorting that material to processing, well, not processing it, to throwing it <laughs> in a landfill, sadly. Um, and then also um, tons of infrastructure that goes into taking raw material out of the ground, put it into, it, pro put it into a, a piece of packaging or product, uh, processing it into that and then um, and then selling that which then goes ultimately into the ground so so this should make economic sense but it doesn't today so the closed loop uh, closed loop partners was created as an investment and innovation fund to invest in the transition between the linear economy into the circular economy and create that catalytic capital needed to reinvest in the infrastructure necessary to make those economics work where they don't ultimately today so just briefly, we have a few different funds and then an innovation arm. Our first fund was started about five years ago. We pulled capital of some of the largest consumer product companies in the world and retailers, Walmart, Unilever, Coca-Cola, all those big guys that have a vested interest in getting that material back, ensuring their consumers can recycle. Um, we pulled that capital and created a below market rate debt fund to invest in infrastructure in North America. And again, it started with the idea of recycling with creating collection infrastructure. But the reality is, is we need to think about this as a supply chain if we're gonna make the economics work. So we really need to invest in the whole supply chain of circularity. So collecting that material, improving these sortation facilities, which were built about 10 to 15 years ago on average, and are typically used to, or set up to collect newspapers. And as you probably all know, newspaper is not what it used to be. And so the material stream is quickly changing and all of these sortation facilities are a bit out of date. And so we need investment to um, capital to invest in those facilities. And then investing in ensuring that the material is high quality enough that it can go back into that um, HP product because like David said, that material gets downgraded over time and there's a lot of innovation that's needed to improve that. So we give below market catalytic capital to invest in that infrastructure, which ultimately comes back and we prove the business model and we pay our investors back. Um, what we found along the way is that there was all this really interesting disruptive technology and business models around circularity from edible compostable straws to food waste that could be turned into energy at your household to reusing apparel and kind of interesting models that were earlier stage. And so we launched a venture fund to invest in more disruptive technologies to drive beyond kind of this circular supply chains of disposable materials, but kind of more diverse um, items, and then also built an innovation firm to do business acceleration of very early stage stuff, and also start convening folks across the supply chain, because mostly across these supply chains, nobody's talking to each other, and that's a real problem. Okay, thank you. Um, just as a, a quick context background, I'm just curious, how many people know, what, related to recycling, what, what China announced at the January 1st of this year, what happened at the beginning of the year? Okay, so, because we were just debating the fact that people like know this story. It looks like, and this is a good crowd for it, but you want to answer? 
Yes. <laughs> That is correct. The, the answer was, ding, 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 that they will no longer import our recycled materials. Basically, the port of LA, um, where a huge percentage of our, our imports from China come in, all those ships, instead of going back empty, were going back with our paper and plastics and newspaper. Um, and they decided they had enough stuff over there, basically. Um, and so that has created an obvious glut in, in materials. Is there anything to add to that? Is that? Well, you know, technically they're taking our material still, but the contamination, we, what we started to do in this country is we started to feed, we, we would send bales of recyclable content, but over time those bales were filled with more and more garbage and got more and more contaminated. And so like if you were buying widgets from me and wanted 20 and right. I gave you 12, but eight of them was junk, right. you'd send them back, right? So that's that's, that's what because started of, to I want to come back <laughs> later maybe to consumers because isn't, what, isn't it called wishful recycling? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Hopeful recycling? Yeah, there's, there's this There's this stuff. theme where we all just hope that the thing we're holding will be recycled so we put it in the garbage and that contaminates the system. Um, all right, well, let's, so picking up yeah. on what you were just talking about, about business models, Jessica, I think it's time to get you into the conversation. Um, talk to us about um, what needs to happen to, to bring circular economy to scale. What are the kind of yeah. business models you think? Because this is, this is more than what we've done in the past. What has to change? And I think you, you laid it out perfectly at the beginning by saying yeah. the big issue is how do we move from this linear to circular models of production and consumption, right? So since the, basically since the beginning of the first industrial revolution, we've had this one-to-one -one relationship between economic growth and the use of natural resources, right? It makes no sense. And today we're using about one and a half planets worth of resources, right? Meaning we're taking more out than we're putting back. Actually, dinner tomorrow, is, over, is Earth Overshoot Day, right? Exactly. Tomorrow is the day that, by, on average, we have, in theory, through this amount of the year, used up our allotment of planetary resources. So after yeah. tomorrow, do not use <laughs> anything <laughs> more without giving back. I mean, what, that basically is what that means. tomorrow around that? Were we doing any yeah. kind of award for Earth Overshoot Day? We're okay. and, and I mean, the big implication is if we continue down that trajectory, right? So essentially, assume we're in 2050 now. We have like 8 billion people on the planet, you know, two-thirds of the planet are living in big cities. At that point, we're gonna be using about four planets, right? So imagine what 2050 will look like, eight billion people, four planets. Clearly not, I assume, an Earth that you want to live on. And honestly, we're not doing that much to get us away from that trajectory. Um, but to Andrew's point earlier, the, one of the only ways to do it is to break that link, right? Or so essentially decouple economic growth from the use of natural resources. And so Accenture, as a company, we, we looked at this problem several years ago and said, you know, what's the role that we play in this, right? We're a big consulting company. We have close to half a million people, um, employees, right? And we work with three quarters of the Fortune 500, right? So we work with really big companies. And at that time, we actually did ask this question and we said, should we try to change consumers? So the person that's throwing out their stuff or using stuff and, and wasting it or, or not using its full life, do we tackle billions of consumers or do we try to instead maybe tackle the top 50 companies that control 80% of the world's supply chain, mm -hmm. right? So clearly from our core business perspective, we said, let's instead tackle the big companies, right? That, that really kind of own the supply chain in many ways. So tackle the production side versus the consumption side. So for us, we look at it similar to what Andrew was talking about from a waste perspective. Instead of even looking at how do we better deal with waste, we said, how do we get rid of the notion of waste altogether? Right? So everything has some sort of useful life to it. Everything has some kind of value. And we look at through a variety of, of different value chains or different circular economy models, very similar to what Bridget said. So it could be from recycling and recovery and using that product in a better way, as, as David showed in, in the video. It could be some of the as-a-service models that David mentioned earlier as well. It could be using sharing economy and sharing platforms. It could be just extending the life of our products or, or, or creating things that are more modular, right? So they're not meant for a one-time use. Imagine every time you wanted to upgrade your phone, if really what you wanted was a new camera, you just switched out the camera, right? Versus getting a new phone, right? That's kind of the modular type of economy. But part of the challenge to your question is, is getting it to scale. So in the last five, seven years, we've seen some really cool models out there. And some of the world's biggest companies, um, biggest multinationals out there, have really started to dive into circular economy models, whether it's Michelin selling tires as a service, HP doing uh, using recycled materials for its cartridges or selling ink as a service, essentially 
Philips doing lighting as a service. You see Nike taking their um, unusable materials from creating shoes um, and using it to create playground equipment. Right? So we're seeing all this really cool examples, but when you add it all up, it's really not getting to the level of scale that we really need to get to to prevent that trajectory towards 2050. So not to sound too doomy and gloomy about it, but right now I don't think we're there. Um, I think the type of things like China's uh, current policy changes and what they're planning for 2020 and 2030 are really encouraging. So it's a combination of policy changes, especially for things that are high volume and low value, right? So think plastic bottles, high volume, tons and tons of plastic waste in the oceans, but really low value, right, for the, the weight of each one. When I look at things that are instead low volume but high value, so think of like copper or um, rare earth minerals that are in your phone or all the cool stuff that's in technology, but there's a ton of value, to your point, that's being thrown out, that's a whole different type of model, right? That's where we need better infrastructure, better supply chains, greater transparency in the supply chain so we know what to do with what materials and, and where are they, you know, from where they originated. Um, we need... I think a lot more leadership, honestly, so more companies like HP and others that are willing to step up um, and say, I'm going to fundamentally change my business models. This is one of those places where it's hard for any one company to make a big shift uh, because you're kind of the only one doing it, right? And the price of your goods will end up going up. And then I'll say we, we also just need a lot more organizations like yours, right, that are infusing innovative capital, infusing funding, and also kind of encouraging these really disruptive business models, right? Because when you get the likes of Uber or Airbnb coming in, it doesn't just change the way companies do things, it completely upends it, right? So we also need more of that disruption. And I think the combination of those things are the things that make me hope, at least, that tomorrow stops for coming overshoot day. You're hopeful, all right. <laughs> so let's, on, let's talk about the, the as a service. Uh, I know both of you have some thoughts on this. Can you just maybe explain when you say Philips does lighting as a service, what, is, what does that look yeah. like? What does that mean? Well, so very few people actually want to buy a light bulb, right? <laughs> unless you have some personal emotional attachment to light bulbs. Very few people want to buy a tire, unless, again, you have some personal emotional attachment to your tires. And I think what these companies are starting to realize is, A, people don't want to own those things. They really want the service, right? I want the light that I'm getting from the light bulb, or I want the tire to take me from point A to point B. Right? I want the service that I'm getting. Um, and then two, these companies are starting to realize that if they sell you a product, like a light bulb or a tire, it's a one-time transaction. If I sell you a service, it's a multi-time, or hopefully a lifetime relationship. Right? So we're starting to see companies, again, like Michelin saying, hey, instead of selling you a tire, I'm gonna sell you these tires as a service. So I, Michelin, still own that tire. I'm just essentially charging you the rent of using it. So everybody wins. Michelin wins because they still have that tire on their books, and they actually get the material back, which they can use back into creating more tires. Um, the customer wins because, again, they have no desire to actually own the tire, and the cost overall is actually lower for them. And they both win because Michelin actually puts these little sensors in the tires that helps them understand when the tire's actually about to go bad. right? So it proactively will replace that tire for you because, again, you're not buying the tire, buying the service, and it starts learning better information about behaviors, right? So what, how are people driving in certain parts of the country or in parts of the world, right? So they start gathering that data, and then they create whole new business streams just from that data. So what is HP doing along those lines? Uh, so I, I think that, that that's, Jessica has, has it spot on, and it, it, a real opportunity here to scale is going to be where, where companies are looking at disruptive business models mm -hmm like that, and they're willing to essentially risk cannibalizing some of their own revenue streams, seeing these opportunities where the economics lines up with the environmental value. People don't buy printers to have a printer. People buy printers to print. And uh, particularly at larger organizations, you can have an awful lot of overhead going on through sprawling IT departments, all the support that's required from computing and printing. And so the same types of, 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 of incentives can line up where Essentially, we're, we or a channel partner will be leasing a fleet of printers to you. Uh, you'll essentially be by the page, so to speak, or whatever kind of model makes sense. We found that, so Merck, for example, a, a part of their European operation, we cut their number of printers by 45%, and that had corresponding reductions in the floor space they had to give printers, the energy they consumed, all the, all the management costs of that fleet, 
and the associated GHG emissions with that. Um, so while that's, that's pretty well established, in, in print, particularly commercial print, I think we'll see more and more of that as it's just a chance to essentially outsource a lot of it. You mentioned Instant Ink, which is where we're trying to take that into the consumer space. And I love the Michelin story because I'm thinking, yes, there's a, there's a lot of very, very similarities here. Essentially where there are two big customer complaint points on ink, right? Cost, and it runs out when I need it. So we said, well, wait a minute. Like, why Now that we have people have printers that are connected to the internet that can print from their phones and do things, why can't we now have the printer be able to detect when the ink is low? And if you've signed up for a subscription service like your phone, um, where you pay a flat fee per month based on how many pages you expect to print, and it can go up or it can go down, you can change that, that printer is going to order you the right cartridge that's going to arrive at your house or your office before you've run out of ink, so it's easy to replace it. That is going to cut your cost of ink down in half, and w and the and the energy use and the carbon footprint associated with the purchase and the disposal of that ink is down 90% because you don't go to the store, it comes in less packaging, and it comes with with a free return envelope, so it ends up back in that same stream as Rosette's water bottles do, right? So those kinds of things that we're seeing more and more with other companies as well, even in our industry, it's where the where the customer value is lining up with the economics, where then we can also drive this environmental circular advantage. So let me play devil's advocate, or, or not devil's advocate, but skeptic. Um, so the problem with being in this for 20 years is you've, sometimes you feel like you've seen it all. We, the, uh, the logic behind service sizing or making service out of products has been there for a long time, right? Um, the Hunter and Amory Levin's book, um, Natural Capitalism, tw almost 20 years ago made this case really, really well. And there's been a few examples in printing has been one. So let's, let's kind of talk a little bit about hurdles to all of this. <laughs> like, why hasn't this been even bigger, right? I mean, th there's the Phillips story, but we hear the same few stories, right? So something is, is lacking. And it, it could be as, as much as a, a psychology of people do like owning things <laughs> like, and, and buying it. Even if you say you don't want the light bulb, there's still something about going to Home Depot and loading up your cart. and. I mean, I don't know if that's the big gap or if it's just inertia in the business system. What do you, I mean, anybody can jump in. What do you well, really, I mean, your point about Home Depot, I don't think that's true anymore. I think yeah. that in our generation, that's yeah. true. But, um, but today, I don't think, people are buying things online. They're not yeah. going into the store and doing it anymore. So I do think that there's a certain kind of mega trend happening around not shopping in the store right. as much that allows for these subscription models and kind of mass customization that people are, there's a lot more kind of niche stuff happening because of that trend right. that's allowing for the service models to take over. But I do think it will require enough of these to exist that that's the normal operating procedure and normal way people are doing business. If it's outside of consumers' norms of how they want and do things, it, it is challenging. And I think that's been one of the bottlenecks for the service model in the past. And, and I'll wallow in your skepticism yeah. for a while since I was gloomy anyway for a while. So just, so in the skeptical roles, right? Because again, we're not moving nearly as fast as we need to be moving either on climate or on any of the SDGs that Amy put up earlier, right? So far away from all of that. So if I wallow for a while, I would just say it, we're, I mean, we, our, those linear models of production and the way in which we consume are so locked in right now. Right, so the, all the examples we're giving are awesome. And, and I truly believe we've seen an acceleration of these new models in the last couple of years. At the same time, all of our models of production and consumption really have been locked in. And it has been that, that correlation between economic growth and consumption. Right, so until A, we get to a point where consumption doesn't have a, that one-to-one -one relationship with economic growth, that's going to be a big challenge, right? Well, and what, what companies are, and CEOs are measured on by investors. Yeah. Exactly. We'll have an investor panel tomorrow. I'm moderating that as well. And we're going to talk about, from, with Walmart and Generation um, Investment Partners, mm -hmm. we're going to have this conversation about what are investors really pushing for. Exactly. So, so well, this is the model, right? The CEO want is, change, is but paid on flow through. Exactly. Right? So until compensation is directly tied, right, and then, or general incentives, right, are tied to these type of models, and then until consumers, that plus consumers wanting something different, and then enough platforms or enough massive movements towards new models happen, you're going to get stuck, right? right? Again, the good news is I think you're starting to see that, right? You're starting to see we have more investors and more pension funds caring about environmental and social issues than they ever did before. We have CEOs and boards that are finally starting to get have compensation tied to things like environmental standards or environmental um, 
quality and output as well as diversity, right? We've never had that before. And I think we are starting to see consumers move in that direction. My big fear is we have two and a half billion people joining the middle class, right? In the next 15 years or so. Those two and a half billion people are gonna want exactly the same things that the current middle class has. Oh, they do. Right? Yeah. So how do you how do we kind of unbreak that that link as well? Starting with things like air conditioning, which the, the projected just on air conditioning growth will yeah. wipe out all of our savings from going to electric cars, right? I mean, we're so I mean the classic example. One of the classic examples, and the data on this isn't probably perfect of of how can we have more service, how can we share, mm -hmm. is the idea of the um, a drill or some some hand tool yeah. that I, I don't know if this stat has really been the perfectly the ten percent no, that that a, that a drill is used something like seven minutes a year yeah. on average in people's homes. So technically, you need one for every like. Town, you know, I mean, you don't. But the problem is, companies don't want to sell one per town, right? So we have this kind of leap to something, something different. You look like you want to jump in. <laughs> I always do. Um, okay. No, I, I mean, I think you have to start with the low hanging fruit of where there's actually an economic model like that. I can't, I can't immediately off the top of my head find the economic model and that right. great idea. But, um, but I do think that companies are looking at their cost of goods sold. They're looking at risk, whether that's regulatory risk, consumer risk, um, they're looking at revenue in the future. So how do you actually plug into those things to, um, to create change? So just going off the service model for a minute and getting back into the consumables and packaging, it does technically cost more technically, to use virgin material, virgin plastics in like a plastic water bottle. But because of the way the fragmentation of the recycled system and the infrastructure and the business models there, there's so many, uh, there's so much transportation and there's so many different players you have to go through to get back, that back into the supply chain that you, you, you lose value and profit along the way. So we have to create better, we have to create vertical integration, we have to create better systems in the manufacturing supply chain to make the cost of goods sold work, and then that should work. They will buy that material if it can be at the right scale, if it can be at the right cost. And that's not going to be everything, and we can't rely on that, but there's a lot of places where we can solve these supply chain challenges in a way that meet their needs today. And then we need to think about some of these other levers that will drive change for these companies tomorrow, because if they're facing, you know, if India is banning single-use plastics, they have to think about that. Whether that's the right decision or not, it's something that they have to now consider because we're in a global, you know, yeah. world. Yeah, we're, say goodbye to straws. Apparently, they're they're going <laughs> but, away. But if I can just say something that maybe I'm popular, like plastics aren't bad. Like we not necessarily. Yeah. Plastics in themselves are a good thing. Like yeah. they are the reason we can fly in planes and the reason we can drive the cars that we drive and they they are they are the reasons we can put certain medical implements in our body. Plastics in itself they aren't bad. Single use plastics or the way in which we process them and the way that we we use them, consume them, meaning for one-time use, right? Um, the chemicals that are used to create them, the way we get rid of them, like, that's the bad stuff. Right. And so I only mention that because I think yeah. we're, we're also very quick as a society, you know, to see a horrible picture of a turtle with a straw in its nose, right? Mm -hmm. And then react by saying, let's ban plastics, as opposed to, is there just a better solution? Because there are so many better solutions. Like, we can make much better plastics. We actually have the technology right now to turn plastics back into itself or actually turn plastics into fuel or turn it into other good materials. So I bring all that up just because I, I think we also just have to be careful not to right. react to, right. to We things. have to separate out the different things. So we, yeah. we, it's hard to think in nuances and it's really easy to say that plastic is bad and in many cases it's just not the right tool for the job. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it, and, and in some cases we need to th innovate to actually to the point you're talking about. We can historically, recycling has been done mechanically, everything gets downgraded over time. There is technology through chemical processes that turns that back into virgin quality that can get back in. It hasn't been scaled. It hasn't, you know, the infrastructure hasn't been set up for that. But for some materials, it's hugely valuable. You know, there's, there, it's, a, it's, the great, it's a great material for the job that's being done. But in other cases, if it needs to be used for seven seconds or seven minutes, one time, it might not be the right job, yeah. might, right material for the job. Yeah. So, I mean, we need a, a nuanced view of plastics and material flows. So let's let's move, I think, to something, uh, an area that's known for its nuance, which is politics and policy. <laughs> um, uh, uh, that was my sarcasm, I'm sorry. So, I mean, what, what policies do we need? Clearly, there's got to be some um, policies or regulations or rules that are in place that are maintaining the current, the current system. Do you guys have thoughts on 
What, what, do you, what would you like to see that would be, that would be helpful? Yeah. Well, sure. Um, I'm not the policy expert, but I'll start with, with a perspective from where we're sitting. I think there's, you know, you could look at it in two ways. You know, on the one hand, we'd say that, uh, you know, policies and regulations have not kept up with, with where we're heading in the circular economy. And, you know, just for example, in many countries, electronics are considered waste at end of use, and it makes it very difficult to move them across borders. And in one sense, that's rightly so. If you don't want them to end up in very bad conditions, and again, some of what has been documented and shown, but that also makes it extremely hard for companies then to offer more extensive and readily available product take-back programs. Or how do we then, how do we actually bring it in to scaled and consolidated reuse and recycling facilities where we can really extract the value back out of it? Standing that up in all countries around the world is simply not going to be feasible. Um, certainly not in the near term. So. That's an area where I think there's a gap. I would say that, on the other hand, it, it can be a real facilitator. I think we've seen that in terms particularly uh, of government procurement requirements, standards, mm -hmm. um, putting this into everything from recycled content in something like as simple as paper, but now increasingly various kinds of attributes of the products that they're buying, including um, recycled content of, of plastic and the like. Um, and, and lastly, I'd say you know that there is there's a role around where government can play to be an innovator, to, to play mm -hmm. partners with a closed loop funds work around um, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna tap into our recycling stream. You know, one, one quick example of that is actually down in, in Boise, where as a result of the Chinese ban, for a few months there, if anyone's in Boise, you'll know that um, they stopped collecting plastics. We had to just throw them out. And then a program was rolled out and very innovatively, the city went out and worked really hard to find out where can we, they take a number of different plastic streams and feed them in through a Dow, a program from Dow DuPont, which is uh, convert, converting that into diesel fuel. So the great thing on the one hand is we've now expanded the number of plastics we can actually recycle. On the other hand, it's a more complicated program. And then I think from our perspective, one of the unfortunate victims, the, the plastic victim of this is number one, PET, probably the most common plastic that we see because according to the systems they have right now, they're not able to, to distinguish that either from paper, if it gets crushed, or because of its chemical composition, it contaminates the anaerobic process being used in those other plastics. So that is, is a great example of where government's stepped in. They've looked for the partners to do it, but it's still, a, I guess I'd say, a suboptimal solution. Yeah. I think a couple things. Um, I'm a big fan of tax incentives for using certain material types uh, or cert, cert, you know, doing the right thing for businesses. Um, so I, I'm gonna give an example that is probably highly unrealistic, but it's just an example of the kind of thing that we think about. Um, it comes from our CEO and he talks about this all day long. That if, a, if a, you know, one of the things that we wanna do is get more recycled content material into packaging. Um, and we want consumers to make the choice to buy recyclable materials and things that have used that material. So it's been kind of gone through the whole cycle and gotten back into the supply chain. So what if um, a municipality that spends money to send waste to a landfill were to give companies a tax incentive to use recycled content in their packaging, they could label that, actually give um, a sales tax holiday to consumers, so consumers actually paid less. Now, there's a, a thousand reasons you could dispute why this wouldn't work, but it's just an idea or an example of the type of creative thinking that you can come up with in terms of how do you make things more cost effective for the consumer, make it better for them, make it better, you know, motivate companies to use more preferable materials, and then ultimately, that what that should mean is that a city should save money because less of the material in their municipality is going to a landfill. So the economics should work, totally oversimplified, but just an example. Yeah. Right, and really, can I just yeah, add, like, yeah. I think, because I like the idea of both incentives and regulations, yeah. because it makes it, it makes it so the company doesn't have to take that step, in a sense, right? It kind of equalizes or levels of playing field. So all companies in that particular country or region or city or mm -hmm. state has to follow the same rules as opposed to one needing to, to step up and do it and then probably being at a cost um, disadvantage. I, I agree that I think I, I would love to see some massive shifts in tax and policies as opposed to just banning of, of importation of certain products or waste um, or, even, or, or even certain incentives. I like that those types of changes I mean, when you think about finite versus in, infinite resources, the really only infinite resource we have are, are humans, and then we have all these finite resources in the ground. Yet we tax 
things in the different way, right? So what if we stopped taxing labor, for example, and instead taxed the stuff that is actually finite, mm -hmm. i.e. the stuff that we're pulling out of the ground? So massive model shifts like that, mm -hmm. I think are much more likely to actually do a step change towards circular economy than like the current like incremental changes. So I actually think we have to do dramatic things like that. Um, or dramatic things like stop taxing labor, yep. uh, you know, and to make the change. And I'm assume, assuming at some point in the next couple of days we'll, we'll talk carbon tax policy yeah. that will come up, and that is exactly. the big idea, yeah. right, yeah. moving taxes. So we have uh, just a one or two minutes left, lightning round. I'm surprised nobody said trade war is a good policy <laughs> idea. I can't believe that. Um, uh, I'm that you will, just did. Well, that will reduce <laughs> the amount of stuff <laughs> as the economic mm. quantity of everything goes down. Um, <laughs> what uh, is the kind of favorite innovation or the let's, – let's end on a high note. What are you – excited about that's going to help bring, bring about and kind of paint the picture of where we could go. Anybody have a top innovation? Can I give two quick things? Because yeah. they're just completely different models. One is um, an example of, so Jose Cuervo is partnering with Ford Motor Company, right? So you wouldn't think of those two, Obviously. right? Tequila driving, yeah. right? That goes together. Yeah. So it's because they have, they have factories that are actually really close together. And so they figured out that they can actually use uh, um, kind of agave fiber the stuff that's left over from creating you know, tequila, agave fiber as a plastic alternative and for cool. some of their vehicles. So I love that kind of thing. And that's that, the last moment that the car and Cuervo should come together. <laughs> yes, and they're probably not going to get co-branded. Right. You're not going to see Jose Cuervo Fords. Right. But that kind of like business-to-business <laughs> -business innovation, I find very cool, especially when they cross industries. And the second one I'll just mention, since we talked about as-a-service models, I was just out in the Amazon, and we were, we were meeting with a farmer that was basically doing bees as a service, right? We have a massive shortage of bees, honeybees. And he, was a, he had trained his honeybees to essentially loan them out to help pollinate other people's um, areas that they needed pollinated. So the idea of this kind of also collusion between uh, our material business world and our natural world and how those things mix together I think is also really cool and exciting. No collusion. All right. No collusion. Sorry. Okay. My quick unsexy one is, is <laughs> I have three. Because three. Okay, one quickly. is just, <laughs> right, chemical, okay, cool. chemical. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> chemical recycling, which I think is yes. going to shift the ability to turn plastic and plastic again, um, which has been a big, pro big problem. Not sexy at all, but really cool. Um, the second one is new material innovation. So one of our investments is in a seaweed material that um, of straws and plastic films and cups, which I think is the appropriate material for certain short use, single use plastics today. And then my third one, which I like the best, is um, it's a residential scale anaerobic digestion system that's very affordable and actually started kind of in the Middle East. Um, and is, was the original market was um, households that were both energy insecure, but also had nothing to do with their waste. They can build it for like a few hundred bucks, put all their waste in there, and it powers their um, cooking for the day, basically, mm. and can be used for human waste. So in areas where girls are traveling and can't go to school because they're traveling to get firewood and things like that to, to create energy and then cook, this creates you know more safety, more opportunity to um, get educated, all kinds of cool things. And we're now looking at bringing that to a Western market and making that like an appliance in the household. All right, I think we have to end on girls in the developing world, unless you have something even <laughs> even better. That's tough. That, that is one, tough. That's a, that's a tough one to do. Um, no, it, it's not going to be that good, but I will throw out that, I, again, because it's very much where, where we're focused now looking forward to the future, is the potential for 3D printing. So 3D mm -hmm. printing at an industrial mm -hmm. level, you know, leaving out a lot of the aspects around, you know, personalized the small batch productions and accelerated prototyping, I think where it's exciting for circular economy is the ability to start addressing product repair. So mm -hmm. I had a fight with my vacuum cleaner a few months ago, um, and it won because um, it refused to stand up when it was supposed to, and a part broke on it. Now, I'm never going to replace that part. Fortunately, it still runs, but most vacuum manufacturers probably don't even bother to make a lot of these parts anymore. So there's just more into the waste right. stream right there. If we can move from needing to manage physical inventories of projected replacement parts across all sorts of volumes mm -hmm. and anticipated failure rates to digital ones you, um, where you can print on demand, you can print cool. locally, that you can extend product lives, whether it's a vacuum cleaner or a, or a car, uh, mm -hmm. by That's years. Awesome. That's a good ending. Please join me in thanking David, Jessica, and Bridget. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.